Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of Frasley for Voges. This week we have part two of our interview with Marek Kijkowiak from Tefl Equity Advocates. This week he talks about informing students on teacher qualifications, teacher nightmares, racism in ELT and what you can do about it. So discussing um, native speakers and teaching qualifications in the classroom, I was at the end of the year last year I asked B2 classes since I had six of them. Um, all adults last year, when they were deciding what academy to go to to get their FCE exam, um, why they all picked my specific class. And, you know, in the north of Spain, there's, I can't remember how many, I, there was 30 plus academies in a town of 300,000. Um, and all of them basically said they picked my class because of the price and the time. That was it. Uh, I asked them, did, this, did the teacher's CV come into it um, or anything more than that? And they said no. Um, so do, do do we have do we have a should we be advertising the the industry different or is this academy owners who, um, mm. by sheer fluke of nature, have got a class that's on at the right time to suit people, um, or should should the students be better informed as to what they're getting? Should should they have say five qu- like. If I do a job interview for an academy, I have about 30 questions for them. Um, should students be taught to have a default five questions before they sign up for classes in an academy? Mm-hmm. Absolutely, yeah. I, I think you know students should be um, taught how to make an informed decision about the English teacher, right? Mm. And I think mm. you know it comes down to how the school... Um, advertises itself and and markets itself. If you know, if the school markets itself on the price, you know, and constantly emphasizes how low our prices are, for example, mm. well, obviously they're going to get those clients that that want that, and the clients will start coming into that school uh, precisely for that. But I think it is really important to sort of to emphasize to even question the word qualified, right? Because right. you know, you might say, okay, we have qualified teachers, but this teacher has done a four-week online TEFL certificate. This teacher has done a CELTA, whereas this yep. teacher has a master's degree in teaching English with 50 hours of teaching practice. Yeah? Mm-hmm. Or, you know, if a student comes into your school and, you know, and asks for, for English classes, you know, they, they, should, they shouldn't be given a choice between, okay, do you want Marek from Poland? Um, or do you want <laughs> Steve from from Ireland or or John from the UK, right? Yeah. They should be given they should be given a profile that doesn't even say where these teachers are from. But you know, look, Marek has done these things. He's taught these people. That's that's his experience. And mm. then Kate has been teaching in these contexts. She's really good at business English. You know, yeah. Who suits you better, really? That's that's mm. an informed choice, I think. Um, and it really d- does come down to the marketing a lot because. I've recently um, conducted a study with um, recruiters about their attitudes to hiring native and non-native speaker teachers. And a lot of these recruiters were based in Spain. And they told me that when they decided to change the policies and kind of start hiring people based on qualifications rather than based on their passport, what they had to do is completely reframe the whole marketing. Because in the hmm. past, you know, they would have British flags everywhere and, you know, yep. they would market themselves as having British teachers. Yeah. Now they have to, they had to rethink it. But they say once they've done it, you know, that the schools are thriving. Mm-hmm. The students are yeah. keep on coming back because they get the best teachers in town. And these recruiters have started to realize that, you know, they're no longer limited to this narrow pool of, say, only British teachers. But mm-hmm. they, they've opened up themselves up to, you know, all these teachers that, whose CVs previously just ended up in the bin. So surely <laughs> right. now, you know... So the quality they, they is going to go up. Absolutely, because you, can, you yeah. can really pick the most qualified teachers for the job. And in the end, you will end up with a very, very mixed staff room, you know? Yeah. Uh, because you will, I, if you're not picking people on nationality, you're picking the best candidates. So eventually, you will end up with people from all sorts of different countries. Yeah, I think I think I think that's a really interesting question. Like this idea of do students really actually want native teachers, or do they think that they want native teachers? And this marketing and this sort of maybe there's a sort of we we have a duty really to kind of educate sort of our, our customers about about the reality of it. And um, I think what's interesting is that I um, so in my usually in the summer I'm um, an academic manager at a summer school in in, in England, um, and 
we have natives and non-native teachers. It, <laughs> we're interested in qualifications and experience and, and nothing else. Um, and actually, um, you know, one of one of our um, regular teachers is is um, is Polish. She's an excellent teacher. Um, and I, I, I've had students come come to the office and sort of say, "Look, <laughs> why is my teacher not not British?" Um, it's like because she's excellent. Um, mm. Basically, because it's excellent. Don't don't you wouldn't wouldn't you like to reach a level in another language whereby you could be hired to teach it? Like that's 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 what we're talking about here. That's the kind of level of English that this woman has. You know, that's 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 extraordinary. That's fantastic. You know, and like turning that conversation around when they when they think about it. Well, actually, yeah, thinking about it, that's pretty impressive. <laughs> you know, that she's not just teaching her native language; she's learned another one and learned to teach it effectively, and has then been hired abroad. You know, that's that's fantastic. And when you turn I, the conversation sure, around. Right. And, I, and I'm sure the vast majority of these students don't leave your language school. Right. They, they stay. Yeah. 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 And, and I think, you know, what it takes as well. And this is what the recruiters told me in that study, that another really important thing is to do what you do when you when you get a student who comes in or a parent complaining why is my <clears throat> yeah. son's or daughter teacher Polish or Chinese? Why aren't they British? You, you know, you have to be prepared to say why this teacher is the best teacher <laughs> yeah. for your son or daughter, right? You, you can't just kind of apologize and say, no, sorry, we'll move your son uh, or daughter no. to a different teacher. No, of course not. That. But I think what's interesting as well is perception as well. I think that was interesting, uh, something I was reading recently about the perceptions of whether or not someone's native and the fact that they can be native. And you mentioned, um, I mentioned Chinese and, of course, the appearance of a Chinese person is different to... Um, what might be perceived as, and that's an important expression, um, a native British or a native American speaker of English. But of course, there are plenty of people who look like they're not in terms of perceptions and racial perceptions, um, but are in fact as native as, as, as me or, or Alan. Um, so wh why do you think this person's not native? <laughs> oh, because they look like they're Chinese. Well, okay, but that doesn't mean they're not native. It doesn't mean they're not qualified. It doesn't mean they're not experienced. Um, yeah. It's all down to perception. So I think that the topic of racism is a really important one as well to, to address mm. because, you know, there are horrific stories, really, both personal stories and in, and in mm -hmm. research of, of how native speakers of color are discriminated against and, and mm -hmm. how they are treated as inferior, both by recruiters and by students. You know, for example, if you are a native speaker of Asian origin and you go to teach in Asia, <laughs> you might be treated as a non-native speaker. You know, you, will, you won't be hired simply mm. because of the way you look. And I, on the other hand, you know, talking about privilege, as a white right. male um, yep. with, you know, fairly decent English, I could go there and, and be hired and be treated as a native speaker. They might ask me to pretend I'm Mark from London, but I could go there and... and but you and can get that. away with that. Yeah, I could get, I could get a, possibly get away with it. And, you know, because of my white face, I would be privileged in that position, yeah. you know. And, yeah. and this, is, this is horrendous as well, you know. And, and I think it's something that we really need to address in our mm -hmm. profession. And, and we can't just ex continue excusing it with the market demand. Because, you know, by constantly accepting those discriminatory demands from students as a school owner, you're, you're, you're just, A, you're profiting from racism, and mm -hmm. B, you're helping to perpetuate it. And, and there is no, there's no other way of looking at it. I mean, if you're in it for the money, fair enough, but we have to acknowledge that you're simply perpetuating and benefiting from racism. Yeah. Yep. Yep. I would be interested to hear your opinion on, uh, I've got a story from um, a long time ago. This was, well, not a long time ago, it was about four years ago. Um, even though Chris and myself have been in Spain for what five years each now, um, my my experience of it has been a bit more negative than his. Um, I I used to work in a town where I made friends with um, an American who was working in a different academy in the town. Now, what happened was she applied through um, a different company and. For all the jobs I've applied for in Spain before, there's a photograph comes with your passport. And I remember mm. asking her about this and there wasn't a photograph required, or sorry, a photo, uh, it's just a photograph of her with the CV. Mm -hmm. And 
she was telling me for this job, she just applied um, and st- the the job application said you had to be whatever, you had to fill in your um, where you're from. So she wrote American, um, applied for the academy, got the job. So got visa sorted out and moved to this school. Now, she is born and bred from San Francisco, but her family is originally from Taiwan. Um <sighs> And sadly for her, she ended up nearly every Friday night in my flat crying because of the abuse she got in that academy every week because they, from her idea, they thought they were getting a white American middle class English teacher. Now, she had, you know, master's degrees in English, everything, you name it. But because of, like you were talking about, perceive her appearance, she was getting so much racial abuse in that academy that it was putting her to tears nearly every week, week in, week That's out. Awful. What what's the advice? What what's the best advice you could give to someone like that? I mean, her her idea, what she what she said was she she had never quit anything in her life and was determined to see the year out, and she did, and went home with just extremely negative memories of the entire mm. year. Um, we used to go through so much wine on a Friday night because it, just, <laughs> you know, it destroyed her like during the week. The the treatment she got was an absolute yeah. disgrace. What's the advice you give to someone who's in that situation? I think it's a, it's a horrific situation. And, you know, and, and again, you know, speaking as privileged as a, as a white male, I've never been... Mm in that situation where kind of my race, you know, obviously that has privileged me. Um, I've been in situations where as a non-native speaker, you know, I was turned down for jobs, but I was never, I never felt like I was being constantly judged for being a non-native speaker. Mm, So, so I, you know, it's, it's really difficult to picture like what she must have been going through and it's just horrendous. But Mm. I mean, I think one thing that's, you know, in situations like that needs to needs to be done is perhaps to get together as as teachers and and all together you know stand up to 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 the employer right. and and try yeah. to solve this this issue that it cannot continue like this because you know one person cannot really change much mm. but if more people kind of go together and, and try to do something about it, this might cause some yeah. kind of change. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know if there is a place, for example, where you can report those kind of situations. But I would be very inclined to, mm. um, to write about my experiences. This mm-hmm. has helped me personally in situations yeah. where I couldn't find a job as a non-native speaker. I felt I was being discriminated against. To write about it on a blog, to write to an ELT magazine, Mm-hmm. Um, and and you know openly name name the school name you know, yeah. tell them I'm 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 writing about it um, whether you like it or not or go to the authorities go to a teaching association uh, go mm. to the local government you know speak to them um, I I think these would be some of the things that that I would do and also try to find a group of people that can support you being in that mm. um, place or online you know where you can kind of get together. There's a group, for example, for women of color in, mm-hmm. in ELT that I, I know a, a teacher uh, called Parisa Mehran um, set up, you know, and that's a group where these teachers can can get together and, and try to think of solutions and support each other, um, you know, online to, to get through these situations. But ultimately, I think, you know, what, what needs to be done is is to to question the whole and challenge the whole discriminatory system and, and status quo, right? Yeah. It's not enough right. just for this teacher to to survive the year and then and then leave. But yeah. then something needs to change about the, the school itself. I mean schools like this should not be allowed to exist. Mm-hmm. Right. Absolutely. The, the the worry the worrying thing was she she stuck out the entire year, but um before before I'd actually met her in the year, one of the there was two te- there was two Americans who had worked in the school, and the the second American teacher had already quit and flown home. But the problem was then they just got someone else in who had say a you know a, a TEFL certificate you know one of the online TEFL certificates, whereas 
she's sitting there with a, de- a degree in English and a teaching master's, but then they've, it's the replaceability mm. as mm. well um, was quite frightening. So I think you know, that's another just, problem in a, uh, you know, industry, because I think yeah. we have to call it an industry. It's not really yeah. a profession The mm. you know, many teachers are simply simply seen by language school owners as commodities easily mm. replaceable that you can throw out and and you know there are so many people every day getting online tefl certificates that you can find 10 teachers in no time especially if you're not yeah. interested in quality yeah. Mm-hmm. And and what what comes into that as well is obviously the low wages for which you work, you know, um, and and all that you know kind of creates this unprofessionalism, I think, in in our industry as well. Mark, I was wondering, is there an issue that primary and high school level education is assumed to be similar around? Well, for in our experience, large parts of Europe, um, causing an issue for non-native English teachers, because in my experience it feels like there's this assumed idea that people in English speaking countries have learned their mother tongue and studied it like you would in school. So for example, a Spaniard will learn Spanish grammar from a young age. Um, Teacher friends of mine are really quite amazed when I tell them um, I had to go to university to study English and then I had to do a master's so so I can teach it. Um, Because naturally, um, if you ask anybody in the street in Belfast or Dublin what the present perfect is, they're going to think you're weird. Um, <laughs> would, would, th- would this sort of knowledge change the outlook for academy owners? Or does that, do you think that just says more about the education in Ireland and the UK in general? I think it probably says more about the, you know, the education in general. And mm. it says mm. a lot as well about you know, the, the perceptions that the, the misconceptions that people have, you know, coming back to the misconceptions about native speakers, proficiency and language awareness, you know, people don't realize that right in, in say, Ireland or the UK, you never study mm. grammar formally mm. in yeah. school, right? They, they assume that you will know it because you're a native speaker, but, but then you don't, right? I think another worrying misconception, and, and I've heard people say that, openly as well in in Facebook discussions, they'll say like, well, but I've got a BA degree in economics from America. So this means, you know, my level of education is much higher than what you would get in your country in Poland. You know, there is this racist assumption that some people have that any degree from any native speaking country is way above any degree from any non-native speaker. Wait, what? Well, sorry, and this is sorry. This is this is my British privilege speaking now. Um, can you just clarify what? So, not to do with English speaking, but just the fact that it's an American degree. It's better than a Polish degree. Yeah. So, what, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that there is a wow. lot of discrimination in terms of qualifications. So, say mm-hmm. if I've got a degree from an English speaking country that qualifies mm-hmm. me for a visa. And that degree can be from in anything. It can be in economics or it can be in English, right? Right. And if I have a degree from a Polish university or a Belgian university in teaching English, that doesn't qualify me to get a visa in certain countries around the world because there is this assumption that people have, well, but, you know, if you you studied in a native-speaking country, then surely your English is better, the level of education is better, everything is is better, right? And and I think it's a, you know, there, there is research as well that, you know, my, my colleague and my co-author of the Teaching English as a Lingua Franca, Robert Lowe, has done on qualifications that English teachers have in Japan, specifically, um, mm-hmm. in private language schools. And it, and it turns out that, you know, people who, local English teachers are kind of forced to do a native speaking qualification, be it a CELTA or be mm-hmm. it a, a, a master's yeah. degree from an English speaking country, just to be seen as equals of native speakers. And I think, you know, th- this, is, this is mad because when I, when I went to do my PhD in New York, okay, I'll, I'll now, you know, just give a personal experience. Obviously, we can't generalize from that. And I don't want to say that now no. that the opposite is true, that degrees from native speaking countries are not good. Of course, some of them are very good. But, you know, when I went to study um, teaching, PhD in teaching English in the University of York, I was shocked to find out that the the students who came in only needed 6.5 denials Mm -hmm. to get in, to study, to be English teachers. I was shocked to find out that the degree only lasted one year and there was not a single minute of teaching practice. 
And those students then came out with a degree in teaching English from the University of York, never having set foot in the classroom, right? And, you know, and then I was talking to my tutor who's Polish. And in fact, he had studied in the same university that I had in Poland, you know, and we got chatting and he was just, you know, he was just shaking his head in disbelief because, you know, mm. many of these students would have never even been admitted to the first year of bachelor's degree in our university, yeah. you know, um, people who finish to do a master's degree in English philology in a good Polish university are incredibly highly qualified and, and incredibly yeah. highly yeah. Proficient um, as well. So the idea that you know having a degree from, say, a University of York is somehow always better than a degree from a non-native speaking country is, you know, is is frankly racist um, yeah. as well. You know, but yeah, unfortunately, a lot of a lot of school owners, a lot of students might initially have this idea. Well, yeah, um, I, w I want to move towards a, towards the final question. Um, we our, our podcast tends to go through. Lots of theoretical things, but try and become practical as well. Um, so for the average teacher listening uh, to this, so not a school owner, not a recruiter, but just an average teacher, um, what sorts of things do you think or would you suggest that they could do to sort of help with this issue or be better informed or, I don't know, reduce the native speakerism we see in the, in the industry? Yeah, I think there's there's a lot of things that we as individuals can do, some of which are sort of classroom based. And, and you have mm -hmm. already mentioned some of them, you know, do activities in class that, that question this privilege, that question native speakerism, that question the idea that a certain pronunciation is better than other ways of mm -hmm. pronouncing things. You know, mm -hmm. this can be a whole class or this can be just a, a five minute or two minute activity. This can be just an additional question that you insert into your lesson. Say you're doing a lesson on uh, job ads. You could use a job ad that you took off tefl.com with you know, native speaker or English speaking countries all over it and just ask your students, you know, do you think these requirements are fair? Why or why not? You know? And again, you don't have to, you know, it's a political controversial subject mm. and you don't necessarily have to express your own opinion on it. Mm -hmm. You can just ask your students to, to discuss it. Right. And, and this being a very controversial subject, it's, it's bound to generate a lot of discussion because students have strong opinions about it and they'll love discussing it. You know, it's like this book, Taboos and Issues. I don't know if, if you have ever used it. I, I used to love it when I was teaching in language schools, mm -hmm. you know, because it was all taboos and mm -hmm. issues that would never feature in a published course book. And they were great topics. Students absolutely love discussing these topics, right? So I think that's one thing that, that, that you could do, you know, try to question um, this attitude in the class. Mm -hmm. Another thing to do is to, is to support your colleagues in the staff room, like what you did with that teacher from, uh, from the US, mm -hmm. you know, support them, help them. I, you know, the first time I was discriminated against in a um, in a job application process, I was supported by a native speaking colleague mm -hmm. um, who were teaching together in San Sebastian. And, you know, and this happened to me and he was the only person in the staff room, you know, and he saw me really distressed and he just came up to me and we started talking about it. And he was like, look, this is completely wrong. I think you should do this. He really encouraged me to take action mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and helped me. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you need that. You need that support as well. So if you see someone, you know, in the staff room who's, who's really suffering from, from, from mm -hmm. these kind of issues. I think it's really important to, um, to address it. And ultimately, you know, get together as a, as a group because the group always has more power than just an individual person uh, yeah. can ever yeah. have. So it's, it's really important. I think the you concept know? of... And there are lots of other things that you can do, like sort of, you know, outside of the classroom or the school. You can blog about mm -hmm. it, um, you know, if you have a platform. If you don't have a platform, you can start one. Um, there are so many job ads that I see every day in Facebook groups uh, for native speakers only. Mm. And there is a lot of people now who mm. are commenting on it. Do, do the same. If you don't feel comfortable commenting on it, maybe just leave an angry face mm. below <laughs> it or something like this. But do, do react to those job yeah. ads. Don't just leave them there. Because if everybody leaves them there, mm. they, they will just continue. But if we, if we all start, imagine if you just spend two minutes a week writing a short comment below one job ad that you saw in one Facebook group. Mm. I mean, it, would, it can truly have a massive effect on, on, on the whole profession, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you think that would, 
you know, you, you mentioned earlier about uh, writing blogs. Should, you know, because there's, there's always this sort of fear of um, sort of almost blacklisting yourself to use the old timey term. Should, should it just be a case of um, naming and shaming when it comes to uh, these issues, you know, publicly naming and shaming like the bad academies? Because, hmm. um, I mean, I've, I've seen academies rename within a week and stay in business. I remember I used to live beside one. I, it, it must have had three different names in six months. It was amazing. Hmm. <laughs> they must have done something really bad. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I think when, when I did it for, for, for the first time, I wrote an article for EL Gazette, mm-hmm. and it was about an international house mm-hmm. school. That's when, you know, this school explicitly told me that, look, your CV is great, but we only hire native speakers, so sorry. And, you know, and I wrote an article about it, but what, what EL Gazette did was to inform the school, look, mm-hmm. this article is going to be published in a few weeks. Would you like to comment on mm-hmm. it? We will insert your comment in the article. And I think that's just good journalistic practice. Definitely. Otherwise, yeah. you might be, you know, taking it to the extreme. You might be sued yeah. uh, for li- libel, yeah. for yeah. example, right? Mm-hmm. So if I was writing a blog post and I was going to name a particular school, I would send it to the school director and say, like, look, I'm writing this blog post. Uh, this has been my experience. This is what I want to write. Do you have an official comment yeah. that you would like me to include with it? Mm-hmm. And then I would just I would just post it. But I wouldn't be afraid of kind of naming and shaming. The, the, yeah. I think sometimes it really needs to be done. Having said that, I think, for example, today I was talking to um, to to a teacher who who was really concerned about um, a certain person in a Facebook group who keeps on posting job ads for native speakers. And, and he wasn't sure how to react to, to her posts, mm-hmm. right? And the advice that I gave him was to contact this person directly, you know, mm-hmm. by a private message. Because often if you do it publicly, the person will get angry, yeah. you know? They'll feel offended. They'll feel publicly shamed. And that's not, that might really not change anything. So I think sometimes, you know, just send them a private message and explain. I wouldn't get angry. I used to get really, really angry and write in a very angry tone. But mm-hmm. I've learned along the years mm-hmm. that this doesn't really help. No matter how frustrated and angry you're feeling, the more sort of polite and, and, and logical and reasonable you sound, the, the better. Because yeah. if you just tell somebody that, oh, your school is completely racist, you, you, shouldn't, you should never exist, right? <laughs> that they'll never listen to yeah. you. <laughs> but if you, you, know, if you start, start a conversation with them mm. and explain why, you know, why you think this is inappropriate, what could, else could be done, how the school could actually benefit from opening themselves up to teachers from all around the world, what we were saying about getting very highly qualified teachers instead, and that's a clear benefit for, for the school. You yeah. know? Then that might start some, some more positive conversation. Um, so you know, if, you, if you were listening to it and you found the ideas interesting, but you would like to delve a little bit deeper and find out a little bit more about how to tackle native speakerism, how to teach English for global communication. Um, Then uh, we've got a book that I uh, published together with Robert J. Lowe. Uh, It's called Teaching English as a Lingua Franca, The Journey from EFL to ELF, where we explain uh, what native speakerism is, and then we provide over 40 practical activities for you to try out with your students. And I would also encourage you, obviously, to visit my website, tefalequityadvocates.com, where you'll find plenty of free resources, blog posts, videos, Mm -hmm. um, PDF guides, and also an academy where you can delve even deeper into the subject and take online courses. Nice one. Thank you very much. Well, all it leaves us to say is thank you very much, Mark, for joining us today. We really appreciate the time and expertise you've given us. Thank you very much. It's been very interesting talking with you. Thanks a lot, guys. Um, I really enjoyed it. I, I can I can also thoroughly recommend uh, the book and the website as well. Um, it's one of my favorite Delta publishing books, and I think it's a lot of a lot of good research in it, a lot of good activities, and like we mentioned earlier, a lot of amazing statistics as well. So thanks for listening to our uh, interview with Mark Kitchkoviak on all things ELT. You can catch him online on TEFL Equity Advocates, and we highly recommend his book, published by Delta Publishing, co-authored by Robert J. Lowe. It's Teaching English as a Lingua Franca, the journey from EFL to ELF. Highly recommended. A great read. So thanks very much for listening. Slonga so follow.